Hey everyone, and welcome to another On The Mat with me, Coach Rodney King. Now, the reason why I'm shooting these videos lately is I'm moving a little bit away from mainly just doing blog articles. I know that everybody's really busy, so I think it's a lot easier to consume a video than it is to take the time out to read a in-depth blog article, so I get that. So I'm just trying this out to see if this is a much better medium to reach everybody in a much easier way. So today I'm sitting at my office, not at the studio, don't know if you can see, but haven't been too well the last couple of days, been fighting a bit of a flu. Um, but nonetheless, I thought, let me get this episode out. Something I want to talk about that's been coming up quite a lot in my studio. So this is the thing. Most of the blog articles and stuff that I write about are based on questions or discussions that I'm having either with my own students or trainers in my, you know, my different programs and so forth or things that come up on Facebook. So this was another one that came up, which I think was really interesting. And the question that was posed to me was, what is the most important um, things that I've learned in my journey as a martial artist that have really enabled me to achieve success in my own personal game. And I think the answer that I gave um, to this particular person wasn't what they were expecting. So let me explain. So for a very long time, I really honestly believed that the best way to get really good at my martial arts game, specifically thinking about my performance game on the mat against resisting uncooperative opponents, was just to train physically harder, put in more physical time, you know, work really hard, the daily grind, and that will equal success. Now, part of that's true because in my early 20s, when I was putting in a lot of time on my physical game, hours and hours each day, I really did see a steep um, uptake on my game, a lot of improvement. But then there was a time when I hit a complete plateau. And I was there for a while and it didn't seem to matter what I did physically like you know okay so work more on my cardio or work more on a heavy bag or work more drills on the focus mitts and so forth none of that seemed to help me overcome this barrier that I found myself this wall that I was hitting um, and so the plateau was there and it wasn't going away and my realization was that really the the, the difference between my best game and my not so best game wasn't so much that my physical techniques let me down, but more so the, for the fact that my inner game let me down. And so this started me on a journey that lasted several years where I really looked into achieving inner excellence and just looking at the inner game a lot more closely. Now, it's interesting because this idea of the inner game is presented often within the world of martial arts but what I noticed was that there wasn't really a game plan nobody really knew exactly how to go from point A to point B so I put my mind to you know kind of developing my own approach my own system that would enable me to achieve inner success on the mat first I started applying it to myself so I was my own test subject so to speak started teaching it then to my students ultimately to my trainers and now we teach this as a program around the world I actually wrote a book about this too called full contact living there what I did was I took the lessons that I learned on the mat and I explored them further on how they can be used off the mat in the world so I'll talk a little bit more about that at the end of this video but need, needless to say I feel that I came up with some answers and I've seen great success in actual fact the program that I developed this inner game program and the acronym that I use for it, which is called the iGamer method, I've taught that to special force military operators as well. And they themselves have said how much that has helped them in their role as soldiers. So it crosses all boundaries. And I think the reason for that is that I've always said that performance is performance. And so when we talk about an environment where we're dealing with high stress, a lot of pressure, be that on the mat in sparring or out on the battlefield, especially if there's, an, you know, there's a chance of you becoming seriously injured or hurt, the inner game is as important on the battlefield as it is in sparring. And so in that sense, a lot of the things that I'm going to talk about in this video, albeit briefly, relates across spectrums so regardless if you know I was using this for sparring or self-preservation 
or I was in a role, for example, like a special force military operator, law enforcement uh, officer, all these things apply because I will make the argument that it's not that your physical technique lets you down, it's your inner game that lets you down, right? So getting a handle on the inner game is crucial if we're talking about long-term uh, performance gains and success. So one of the first things that I realized was that this idea of always having expectations and we tend to have expectations naturally because we expect to do a certain way but the problem with an expectation is it sets up unrealistic um, environments where it's often not possible to re reach those expectations. Perfection really is an illusion. So, so let me give you an example. In a sparring environment, when you're dealing with a chaotic system, a human being, that person is not going to tell you what they're going to do next. You have no privy to their inner domain, their consciousness, and what they're thinking about. So you're not going to know what they're going to be doing until it's right on top of you. So you're not going to know what they're going to be doing until it's right on top of you. The problem there is that you can try to pre-plan as much as you like, but at the end of the day, what it ultimately comes down to is how you perform in the moment as the situation unfolds. So of course you need training, you need, you know, you need skill sets, you need to have the physical game, but clearly in that kind of situation, how you show up is really important and how you in a game and how you activate it and how you manage it in a highly stressful situation is going to be the make or break between doing really well or doing really, really badly. So with that said, the idea of putting aside expectations on not expecting things to be perfect, the question is how do you actually engage in that kind of environment? How do you actually um, surf the edge of chaos, so to speak? So one of the things that I noticed in myself was that when I was sparring, I would spend an inordinate amount of time either in the future trying to project in the future you know in the sense of if the person does this next I'm going to do this right so almost trying to preempt what the person was about to do or I was holding on to the past in the sense of the mistakes that I just made and that's very very typical right we tend to do that we either projecting into the future hoping that the situation is going to unfold exactly as we would like it to be there's those expectations there's that idea of perfection or we hold on to the mistakes that we just made. And the idea that came out of that was really this, is that anytime you're in the future or you're holding on to the past, what you can't do is you can't respond with clarity and focus in the moment of that experience. One of the jokes that I always make with my students is that, you know, you can be thinking in the future or you can be holding on to the past, but that doesn't stop me from punching you in the face. So in that sense, what I'm really saying is that the game is going to continue regardless of where your head's at. The problem is, though, is that depending on where your head's at is going to determine how that game is going to unfold. And if you're not in the present moment and you're not exactly right there in that moment of clarity and focus and the ability to respond adequately, then you're going to find yourself in a really bad situation. So the first lesson is, is that it's not that thinking is inherently bad, but it's really where you place your attention that can get you into trouble. I have a lot of different ways of approaching that. I actually talk about this on my podcast, Combat Intelligent Athlete, where I talked about task relevant cues. So I would suggest that if you're interested in the inner game, that you go and check out the, the podcast. I'll put the link below this video so you can go have a, a listen to, that, to those episodes. But I talk about ways of tricking your thinking mind, you know, to place it back into the present moment, which is really what you want to be able to do if you want to spar at a high level. The second thing that I realized is that how you show up matters more than you think. So your body attitude, your body posture is very important. What's interesting is that I've been teaching this for a while. As I said, I was my own test subject. And then I started teaching it to other people. And now science is caught up with stuff that I intuitively knew was right, but I couldn't prove it scientifically. The science is caught up with it. So what we now know is that the way that you hold your body, the way you present your body to the world, so to speak, changes your physiology. And when that changes, it changes the way that you feel and ultimately the way that you think about yourself. 
So your body posture is going to change the way that you think about yourself. Think about that for a second. Excuse the pun. But think about that. That's really important, right? So if I can use my thinking mind to change the experience that I'm having in the moment, what it's also saying is that I can use my body to change my thinking mind. In each case, what I'm doing is I have the opportunity now to engage with the experience that I'm in in a very different way. So what I discovered is that, for myself at least, is that if I'm in a really strong, structured stance, closed, tight, not making any kind of openings, that really builds my confidence. I talk about this in training as building psychological armor. If I don't feel that you can hurt me, right, and I don't feel like your strikes can get in and do any damage to me, then naturally, as a consequence to that, my confidence will go up. And that's a very good place to be, of course. So when I think about Crazy Monkey Defense, our focus on good structure, good movement, and defense first as prime primary, that is all about not only not getting hurt, but it's also about building that psychological armor. That is using our body to change our mind state. So the research that's come out, like I noted, was that depending on how you hold your body changes the way that you think. So if you stand in a confident position, you pull your shoulders back, you know, lift your, lift your head up, not looking down to the floor, you're not slumped over, you stand in a confident position, that changes your physiology in a positive way, and that will change the way that you feel and think about yourself in a positive way. Conversely, if you hold yourself in a slumped over, kind of dejected kind of posture, that's going to also affect the way that you feel and think, and not in a necessarily in a positive way. So it's going to be more negative. This is one of the reasons why I am not a fan of this kind of open, kind of flamboyant style of sparring. I know it does work for some people, but I think over, overarchingly it's not an effective approach for most people. When it's working, it's great, but when it fails you, it's a really bad thing. And what you tend to find is that when people are really open like this and they get caught with a shot that rings their bell, naturally what they want to do is they want to try to move away from it. They start flinching, they turn away, they might even go into a fetal position. If we're talking about self-preservation, that's obviously not the kind of place you want to go to. So I find that being in a tight structure, where I talk about keeping all the hatches closed as much as possible, riding the incoming storm with my defense, not only is that going to keep me physically safe, but the body posture that I'm holding changes my psychology into a positive way. So just to kind of recap two things that I talked about there was one, you can intentionally change the way that you think into a more present tense, right? By knowing how to do that through, for example, task relevant cues, which I talk about in the Combat Intelligent Athlete show, or I can use my body to change the way that I'm thinking. By changing the way that I hold my body will change it either my thinking mind into more a positive confident outlook or more of a dejected kind of I'm afraid kind of position. So this is interesting. It's very important. I don't think most people think about it in that way is that the way that you hold your body matters more than you think. The other thing that I that I realized which combines these two ideas together which is really just kind of reiterates what I said in the beginning is that when I'm present, when I'm completely in the present moment, what I call mindfulness in action, my ability to be completely present in a sparring environment, not attaching to the way that I'm feeling and thinking, not attaching to what's happening right now, and just performing in the present moment, that is when I have my best experiences on the mat. It also suggests something which is very important, is that just because I'm feeling or thinking a certain way doesn't necessarily define the outcome of that sparring match. And oftentimes, for a long time, that's what I thought. I thought if I was feeling kind of not in the mood or, you know, I was a little bit sore or injured or my head wasn't in the right space, that that meant that, you know, I was going to have a really bad performance. Sometimes I did, sometimes I didn't. But what I realized was that when I was feeling or thinking that way, in a negative way, but I didn't attach to the way that I was feeling a thing, I didn't judge it, I just allowed it to be, which is the essence of being mindful, I was still able to perform at a very high level. In actual fact, it always takes me by surprise how you can be completely present in the moment, not attaching to the way that you're feeling or thinking, not attaching to what the person is doing to you, in, in essence, what almost feels like you're not thinking at all, yet your body is doing exactly what it's meant to do. It's performing at a very high level. 
this is what oftentimes in the martial arts is this idea of mind body of the yin and the yang right it's the integration of mind and body that's really what the martial arts is suggesting that you can get to and this is how you get to it this is how you train to become that this idea of being mindful in action in itself is nothing new you can go back and you can read oftentimes the, you, when you look at this the samurai they would mention this on many occasions about being completely present and it makes perfect sense the last thing you want to be doing when somebody's coming at you with a sword is start second guessing if you've done enough training right or you, even if you are actually prepared to deal with this because as soon as you do that, you pull yourself away from that experience, you move somewhere else, either in the past or the future, and because you have no longer contact with the present moment, this is where errors happen, and you may inevitably, ultimately pay the ultimate price by losing your life. So I can see why the samurai would be such advocates of being in the present moment, because that's where you are clear, that's where you can think in that moment with clarity, and focus and make appropriate adjustments to your game. Another realization that came out for me in, in the several years of research was that one of the things that can also trip you up is suboptimal breathing. Now, just quickly on this is that you know what we now know from the autonomic nervous system is that if you separate them basically into two parts you have the parasympathetic nervous system and the sympathetic nervous system now whoever named it sympathetic i'm not really sure because it's not always very sympathetic to you but the sympathetic nervous system is that part of your ans that gets you ready for a fight or to flee so anytime you felt the butterflies the dry mouth you know clammy hands those kinds of things that is your sympathetic nervous system getting you ready for a performance getting ready for a situation that it feels is a threat to you now, that's fine when it's working well, but, but if suddenly you get highly stressed out, you know, super fearful, super anxious, the first thing that starts happening is your breathing goes. And when you have suboptimal breathing, that's going to affect your performance. So you might be in really good shape, but if you don't breathe effectively through your anxiety, through the stress that you find yourself in, you can gash yourself really quickly. So knowing how to breathe effectively is crucial in the fight world be that in sparring or out on the street knowing how to breathe correctly can mean the difference between lasting only three rounds or going 16 so breath is very important the final point that i realized was that resilience is key so what is resilience resilience is my ability to bounce back in the midst of setbacks so even though i've had a setback and things haven't worked out the way that i wanted to am i able to get back on the bike so to speak you know get back on and and just try again right because oftentimes when people hit a wall and then and they don't achieve the outcome that they want they quit if I can give you any kind of advice in my experience it's not the most talented people that make it in this game it's definitely the people that are the most consistent so rather than constantly focusing on the end goal what I've always done is focus on the journey to me consistency always wins the race I've seen a lot of people that were much more talented than me, that they were better at the fight game than, than I was, but they always had unrealistic, unrealistic expectations. They would train like, like demons for a short period of time, but then when they hit an obstacle, they would slow down or they wouldn't come to training. Where I just kind of kept plodding along with my two left feet, because I really sucked at martial arts for a very long time, and just kept working at it. And so resilience is really the difference between those who win and those who lose. So when you bring all of this together, really what I'm talking about is something that has always been positioned in the martial arts world, but I would say greatly overlooked, underestimated, and definitely not taught today, is the, the importance of the inner game. And I went over it very briefly. All right? If you want more information on this, you can go to coachrodneyking.org. Um, you know, there's stuff on there about it. You can go to fullcontactliving.org where really this is the program that I deliver to organizations and uh, teams around the world. Uh, or you can just get a copy of my book, Full Contact Living, where I really go into this in, in more detail. And if you like it, 
let me know if you like this video let me know and I'll, I'll, I'll do more videos on it as well but I'm, I'm touching on this as well in my podcast the combat intelligent athlete show because I really believe that this is the difference between winning and losing I really believe that this is the thing that will take your game to the next level the inner game is absolutely crucial we like I said we talk talk about it all the time in the martial arts world but nobody really has a system a process on how to get there and this is one of the things I've tried to focus in my own training and my own journey is to really figure it out now something I hinted on in the beginning was crucial here for me is that just really developing my inner game for the fight for sparring has helped me achieve much greater success off the mat in the world so where before um, I was highly reactive um, volatile maybe you know just you know if something got in my way I get really pissed off and angry I find myself much more calmer more focused um, and more rational these days partly because I can be mindful in action when somebody's trying to punch me in the face so all of these ideas all of these tools that I'm talking about cross over into what I call taking on the martial arts of everyday life more skillfully this is important now of course these tools apply across the board like I said in the beginning self-preservation sparring and so forth any kind of high performance environment having an inner game and knowing and, and having the confidence that you have it can put you in a really good position in those kinds of situations to win and to overcome adversity but it's also equally important in your everyday life as a martial arts coach my responsibility is not only to help my students learn how to defend themselves but also, as I've been noting, to take on the martial arts of everyday life more skillfully. I think as martial artists, as coaches of martial arts, we have something very profound to offer the world. We have something that can really help the world in a positive way. Why? Because we don't avoid violence. We understand violence. We actually go into violence. And the paradox is, is that we come out less violent, more centered, more focused. Um, and more in tune with ourselves and the world so I think that we have something very powerful to offer the world that we live in because if you go by the media the world is a very violent place supposedly and we should be shit scared and I don't think that you can understand violence or even overcome violence without going into it I think you need to go into it to to be able to transcend it is what I'm saying and I, I think martial arts is one of the most beautiful ways to do that. So one of the things I want to just kind of end this video with is that if you're watching this and you're a martial arts instructor, please don't buy into all this reality-based self-defense rhetoric and, and this paranoia and stuff. Your job is not to make people more afraid. It's to make them more confident. And it's not just only about getting them prepared for a situation where maybe one day they may find themselves in interpersonal violence and they need to be able to deploy those skills. But I'd argue that they need what you have to offer them every second of every day as they move around in the world that we live in. And so in that sense, as a coach, if I can give my students skill sets that will equip them for the 24 hours of every single day they're not with me, then I've really achieved something of importance and I would make the argument that what we are instilling in our students this idea of the inner game enables them to engage in the world in a much better more proactive kind of way and not a reactionary way and because they understand the nature of violence they can transcend it and make the world a better place